you heard her. You heard her. So this is, we're doing it now. <laughs> All right. Hey, yes, Tara Alexander and Hanka Hanka. Thanks so much again for joining us and congrats on successfully doing an APAP showcase in 2022. <laughs> Thank you very much, Derek. <laughs> uh, also, Anka, congrats on the new album called Universal Ancestry and Taro Echoes of the Masters. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, this, yeah. this record is dedicated to my father, in tribute to my father, Roland Alexander, and all of the real true masters of this music. Such as uh, Freddie yeah. Hubbard, uh, Freddie Waits, uh, Roy Brooks, Hakeem Jami, Kiani Zawadi, Gary Bartz, Carlos Garnett, so on and so forth. The Masters. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. So, Taro, can you answer a, long, a long, lifelong question? Is that you in that Archie Shep album with your dad? Yes, it is. All right. Yeah, I think I was probably about four, five, somewhere around that area. Wow. Yeah, I could remember that like it was yesterday. Billy Higgins, oh, tons of musicians on, on this legendary recording. Howard McGee, yeah, that's, so for folks who don't know, Taro's father, Roland Alexander, was on that session with Archie Shep, the Attica Blues album from 1972, which was really, really remarkable. And so if you look at you've got the original album, you look at inside the gate bowl, then you'll see, wait, you're about seven, six or seven, Taro? Uh, uh, my age at that time? Yeah. Yeah, around that area. Yep. Little guy. <laughs> <laughs> Small kid. So, yes, sir. For folks who don't know, tell, tell us about your dad in terms of the musician that he was and uh, how he influenced you to follow the path. Oh, well, uh, he came to New York to, to uh, live permanently around 58, 59. And um, he used to just take me to a lot of his concerts and rehearsals and stuff like that. So I was, at a young age, I was around all the greatest musicians in the world. And um, when he used to throw on some of the John Coltrane albums that was avant-garde, it used to scare me to death. I was like, Dad, what is that? I ran in a room and stuff. But as I started getting older and started really analyzing the music, you know, it was, some of the greatest stuff I ever heard in my life. And uh, I started banging on pots and pans and stuff like that. And one of the yeah. records that really got, caught my attention was uh, McCoy Tana's, uh Expansions album with Freddie Waits and Gary Bartz and Herbie Lewis, Wayne Shorter, uh, Woody Shaw. And uh, I used to you know, sit down next to the record player and the speaker and start banging out the rhythms and stuff mm. my father. I you know, started buying me pieces of uh, drums, you know, to put together a drum set. And I started playing ever since then. It never stopped. Yeah. Talk about that, that generation of folks. Are, we're around the same age. Talk about, I mean, the people you came up with in the 80s and early 90s in terms of, because we were that bridge of people, the masters are still with us. And they literally, well, they're giving us a torch, passing the torch to us. What was that experience like? But you were there, you were living in it, you were in the trenches. What was that like to know you were walking on the same stage as those masters and they were literally handing you the torch? Wow. Um, uh, wow, it's an unforgettable experience. Um, I remember being around uh, Philly Joe Jones and, uh, uh, you know, R. Blakey, Max. Uh, oh, you know, just like I said, man, ever since ever since then, I started banging on the pot. I just never stopped playing. Um, I used to be in a big band called Young Musicians of uh, New York City, and Joe Chambers and Bill Saxon used to run, used to do the conduction of that band. I was just around all of them. Reggie Workman used to call me up for gigs when I was like 12, 13 years old, and you know, experiences like that. So I even got a chance to even, you know, actually play with some of these great musicians at a very, very, very young age, you know? And um, just like uh, my father was talking to Papa Joe and, um, and a lot, to a lot of other drummers about me and they just said, just leave him alone, he's a natural. 
you know, so um, it's a hell of an experience all the way up to now. So yeah. that's why I recorded this album here because all the rest of the records is just, you know, me, 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 it's all about me, me, me. No, this record is not about me. It's about all the greatest musicians that ever walked this planet, the musicians that's with us, the masses, and the ones that went, you know, that's not here anymore, that passed. So this is what this project is all about, it's honoring them. This yeah. Mm -hmm. So our, that being said, in the last year, we, we lost Ralph Peterson. This last, last week, we lost Montez Coleman. And talk about oh, their cool. legacies, because this generation, now our, our circle now, we're starting to deal with losses like that. So give us an idea right. of their legacies to you and to the, to the music. Um, well, I didn't really know Ralph Peterson personally, but he was definitely one of the, uh, one of the, one of the greatest drummers that I ever, um, experienced here. Um, he had that fire like Art and, and Max and all the rest of the master drummers and, Montez, again, um, actually he had took the, um, well, my father had got sick at the time I was playing with Roy Hargrove. So um, I couldn't make the rest of those tours that was happening. So uh, I think Donald Edwards had the chair for a second. And then um, Montez had, you know, took in the drum seat after Donald Edwards. And um, uh, Montez is, Monster cat, monster drummer. Yeah, he's gonna be very truly missed. Man, that was a shock. I had just found out at a rehearsal the other day about it. I didn't know nothing about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you know, rest in peace, my brother. The deep cat, mm. real great drummer, good drummer. Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about this, about our music is that it can bridge so many different worlds together. Literally, I'm looking at it. Together, sitting next to each other, bridging literally an ocean apart, but the music is brought together. So, talk about Hanka. How did you discover our music of jazz, and what 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 did it, and how did it bring you here in the states? Right, um, it's an interesting story. You know, I was born in a country that has no uh, origins or history of jazz, truthfully, but we love jazz and we appreciate jazz musicians and we love. Uh, um, the culture, um, most of the culture I've been exposed uh, and my peers uh, was classical music and of course folk music, um, Slovak folk music that everybody grew up on. Uh, but my story is a little interesting because I was born in Slovakia, but when I was about one year old, my parents, uh, both professors of geology, took me to Mongolian desert. So I grew up in Mongolia for another um, six or seven years in the Gobi desert. Um, so that kind of influenced, you, you know, um, my upbringing, um, being open to different cultures uh, and being free, truthfully, because I didn't go to kindergarten or anything like that until I just went into school and that was a little harder for me because <laughs> I was really free and we've been playing outside and it's been, it's been just amazing uh, childhood. So um, I started to listen to music thanks to my dad who was... Um, a big fan of, um, of Chuck Berry and all the Motown artists. So he was playing guitar and, you know, uh, those times were really difficult for Slovakia and those countries because it was communism. So all the Western culture was banned uh, and everybody was prosecuted if you would be even listening to the records. So uh, since we've been in Mongolia, you know, it was a little bit more um, free of the ability to listen to that music. So. First thing, uh, what was, he bought all these records and we've been listening to the records and uh, playing that music. And that's why sometimes it's so funny because people ask me in the US, how do you know all these Motown songs? And I'm like, well, because my father was playing it for me. And then a little later, after um, a revolution broke up in Slovakia, we had a guest who is now, um, uh, she was American student, Karen Jacobs, and she came to teach English to countries that never um, knew how to speak English or people haven't been exposed. And she stayed with us for more than a year and married uh, our neighbor. So it's, she became like a member of a family, you know, and that really helped me also because she brought some music in. So it's been like mute, like various influences, you know, that kind of shape up my, my style. I was always... Um, 
very natural. I used to dance. I never thought I would be a singer. I was I thought I would be a dancer. And um, as the time progressed and I became older and older, I was more inclined to, into singing. But um, like I said, you know, my parents never thought that, that um, I would be a professional singer. Uh, they all thought like you should really study management and economics, just make sure you make the money. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's so difficult when your heart um, leads you to music. And I understand that a lot of artists probably feel the same way. Uh, you just, uh, it's a calling, you know. So once it's a calling, you just can't stop it. Um, and uh, um, fast forward, I went to different bands and different genres. And um, I also lived uh, half a year in Washington, D.C. in uh, 2001, uh, hmm. where I, um, during my university studies, and uh, I was a singing server over there. And that was the first time it was a bistro or a restaurant called Mimi's. And um, the musical director told me um, at, the, um, at that time that I'm, my voice would be great for jazz. And um, before that, I was more into popular genres like funk, R&B, um, and, and so on, but um, pop music, but I haven't really thought about jazz, but jazz was really um, a music that my sister was singing prior to that. So. Um, I think, you know, I'm not sure about some other artists, unless they're brought up with jazz, I think you kind of need to grow up into that genre, you know, you got to have some experience, some life experience, so when you're singing about stuff, you, you know what you're thinking about, uh, singing about uh, um, in your real life, so that way I kind of progressed, and um, I um, started to sing jazz, and I never stopped since then. And uh, I always fused it with other genres, though. And I think that really describes my um, musical career, that it's uh, not always a straight-ahead jazz, although I listen to straight-ahead jazz and I love it, but it's been influenced by my cultural influences, like Slovak folk music, like um, uh, R&B, punk gospel music, when I came to New York uh, five and a half years ago, um, that really shaped up my um, influence as well, because I started to sing in a um, um, beautiful church called um, Memorial Baptist Church in Harlem uh, for about a year or so, and um, I was very blessed because they gave me uh, a wonderful um, lessons uh, in terms vocally, but also culturally, um, in terms of the roots of this music. And um, it's been a very eye-opening experience for me, Derek, being in the United States and um, understanding the um, roots of this music, uh, Black music, African-American music. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's truthfully, um, there's a lot of discussions in Europe and, it's, and, and I, I have to admit that while being over here and understanding and listening to all the masters and being in the in the society of little older musicians that has been in direct contact with the masters, I completely understood that, um, you know, there has been people that put life um, uh, for this music and that um, uh, literally it's no joke. So, so basically uh, when, I'm, when we were in Slovakia, we probably didn't have this, um, this knowledge, the direct knowledge, or it didn't get to us. It's more through the music, but that when, when I came to US, it was more about the history of the music and the roots and what it took for Billie Holiday to sing that strange fruit and um, those other songs, you know? So, um, yeah, I think I, that was a long answer, right? <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's a answer. Actually, all the four questions I had in between, you had them all. So right. you're in New York. So how did you two meet? Uh, we met uh, in Smalls. Uh, this, <laughs> uh, I have a gig down uh, in Brooklyn uh, most likely it was a Friday night, and um, I would go down to Smalls. Just to, all the musicians would go down to Smalls after the after their gigs or whatever, yeah. just to go to hang out. And I seen her at the bar, and I just literally grabbed her and started kissing her. <laughs> <laughs> that was that? it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Chiru. From well, she was calling me and said, "Chiru, Chiru," and you know. I Looked around and said, hey, how you doing? I was like, wow, so beautiful. I think we started as friends and um, <laughs> <laughs> I came to New York alone, you know, by myself. So, um, of course, um, you know, I was hanging out on the scene trying to uh, meet everybody and sing where I could so they could meet me. Um, and um, Taru was there and he had a lot to offer musically as well, you know, so that was really 
great to be um, around him. And I really admired him as a, as a drummer too. I haven't heard um, a drummer with that type of approach. Very creative and uh, almost like a pianist, har harmonically and working with the singer so well. Um, so I was really, um, um, really like um, amazed. So <laughs> that's how it started. <laughs> nice. Very cool. So it's true for you being a drummer. What's it? Talk about Arthur, RTL, let's just say that the biggest challenge is who are you playing for? The musician, I mean, yourself, the audience, or the other people on the bandstand. But as a drummer, you got to do all, you got to please all three. So how do you do that? Especially even a singer, you're taking care of a singer. You got to also make sure she's right. set up a frame for her, for him. Um, well, I've got the greatest opportunity to work with some of the greatest singers in the world, such as Betty Carter, uh, Abby Lincoln and so on. And um, when it comes, yeah, it's basically, you have to listen. You have to listen to everything going on in the band. Um, you know, to be able to project uh, different sound sources that's intertwined with whatever what composition that you're playing. And also, uh, Actually, me and Antoine had a conversation because he used to work with uh, either Elvin or, or Tony Wins, you know, Antoine Rooney, Wallace Rooney's right. brother. You know, yeah. he was saying a lot of those drummers, they play, uh, it's, it depends on the type of room also. You know, the acoustics and uh, certain other, you know, situations that's dealing with, you know, room and space and control, uh, you know, dynamics, you know, play loud, play soft, uh, especially with singers, you have to, you have to um, just accompany them a, a certain type of way where it's not overbearing, overpowerful. You have to be sensitive, you know, to what's actually going on as far as when it comes to, you know, performing with, you know, singers. Right, so, it's so funny. I was just going to ask you, because you worked with both Abby Lincoln and Betty Carter, what were they like? Because, I mean, you're talking about two singers who, I mean, obviously expected and demanded perfection and involved. They wanted the best out of you. Who, and, if, you know, they wanted to make sure you bring it. Um, I, I mean, Abby was cool with me. She really didn't say anything to me. <laughs> Not too much. You know, she was just. You know, um, Rodney just told me, Rodney Kendricks, by the way, pianist that uh, yeah. actually gave me a helping hand with this project here. Um, she was just a beautiful person, man. Um, I learned a lot from her. And Betty, too, you know, she knew my father, Roland. My father, Roland Alexander, performed with her quite a few times. And she was just cool with me, too. I mean, I heard a lot of stories about, you know, how Betty would get on a drummer and actually, you know, fire cats right on the spot and yeah. situations like that. But, um, yeah, that's basically it, when, when, you know, when it comes to Betty and Abby. And two both different uh, concepts of singing periods. So, see, that's another thing I wanted to state also. I'm not, nowadays, I don't hear no type of identity when it's coming to uh, musicians and stuff coming up now because in these schools, all they do, just like Gary Barr said, all they do is just giving them data and they just regurgitating <laughs> it, you know? So I'm not really hearing too much creativity all I'm hearing nowadays is kind of like the know-how and of, of writing and all this complicated, like cats are writing tunes. I got a billion notes to it. You know, like, you know, like they got their tune. Don't mean no thing if it ain't swinging. Sorry. <laughs> You're not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yes, funny sir. you were mm -hmm. talking to Roy Hargrove. I remember it was at, at Smalls and he was just talking about kids who don't want to understand the, blue, the basic of the blues or understand the context of the music. They just want to get to the notes and tones without understanding right. where the music came from. And right. why do you think that is? Why, why, also, why is there a disconnect? Because in the old days, well, the old days of the 90s, 
you wanted to understand the music and the context because you couldn't get both one without the other. So what mm -hmm. do you think happened? Why, why do you think there was a drop in that or disconnect now? Um, uh, basically the, the lack of, uh, well, I'll put it like this, like when, like in my father's days, it was um, definitely important for kids to get have piano lessons and stuff at an early age and keep them occupied. Now you got broken homes, then mm. they don't have uh, music going on in certain school systems and stuff like that. And just the lack of um, knowledge of the music period. And they're not, you know, they have extended the younger kids are actually calling us old heads. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, it's basically that attitude where, like, you know, I know it all, this and that. And, um, you know, and they teach the blues in school, basically, you know, the structure and all of that. That's good, too, to know, but they're not teaching them the history of uh you know, where it comes from, you know, slavery, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, the feeling is, is not there. Yeah. It's just empty. I think if I can add, I think it's a generational issue where, um, unfortunately, with the broad of social media, in my view, people are just self-centered and they just mm. go on, you know, about themselves and how to make me a star. It's all about me, 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 you know. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, being a little bit more humble, but this all social media um, status is not making you humble. It's making you the total opposite, you know? I so, think it totally destroyed the uh, total integrity of this music, to tell you the truth. Isn't it ironic that it's supposed to broaden people's knowledge? Yeah, well, uh, basically, that's what I really think, because... You know, it, it takes away the attention from what's important instead of, you know, promote. We all have to promote ourselves, but sometimes it's so overwhelming for the artist. You got to constantly promote yourself, you know, and that's why it's uh, unnatural for some of the older musicians to post about themselves because they haven't been brought up that, that way. But for younger generation, they've been born with um, um, smartphones, Computer you know, age. and everything. So maybe that's why and i think psychologically they just people stop reading books you know um younger generation they're just watching tv and at the same time looking at the smartphone so what do we want you know it's so much distraction and so it's very shallow and it doesn't go into depth in my view but of course there are rare examples where you know great young musicians they take take time and they they study so we have to acknowledge that so we don't sound like old heads. We are a generational difference, but, mm, <laughs> mm. but still, I think they are, you know, who wants to take that time is going to take that time. You see, just like when I was coming up, you know, we would, uh, we would actually get on the phone and call these great musicians, you know, can I, can I come by the house, uh, Mr. Roach or whatever, you know, um, sit down and, and learn, you know, you know, mentors. They don't have any, you know, mentor. Like mm -hmm. a lot of them, they're coming out of college and they're putting these, together these bands. They're not even ready to even have a band yet. Tell you the truth, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. what you going to do? <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I remember a few years ago, Harold Mayburn was telling me. Yes, sir. People were asking him, his band was asking, why don't why can't we play lead working tunes? This is like for a long time his bandmates were like, why, why can't we play lead tunes? And he said something I thought was really profound. Said, you guys aren't ready to play it yet. Mm. Wow. Dang, You're not dang. ready. You're not ready yet. About? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> for years, they were angry. We want to play. We want to play site. We want to play. You're like, you're not ready. Although obviously mm. you're technically ready, but you're not emotionally exactly. prepared to play music right. yet. And then all of a sudden, some of the guys started having some life issues. And then Harold said, now he would call lead tunes, because now we want right. to stay. Mm. <laughs> Here it is. And <laughs> it, it dawned, I'm like, you know what? It's, it's more than just the notes and tones. That's why I like the blues, like my father used to say, OK, we got the structure of the blues. The blues is Miles Davis coming outside during his break, and a police officer 
hitting him upside the head with a with a you know with his uh weapon or whatever. Yeah. You know, uh the blues is my father riding in the car with uh Doug Watkins and the rest of the band driving to California and getting a head-on accident. And uh, Doug Watkins gets killed. That's the blues. Mm. You know. Wow. So is that like I don't have no, I have no money in my pocket. That's the blues. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, break up from, right. from a love. From right. Love. That's, That's the blues. Love. That's you know, it's funny. It's, it's about life. So music is about, you can't separate music from life experience, although in conservatory, right. you can you the notes and the tones, but with our music, you can't. And I think right. that's where, at least for Basically me, I'm almost this autobiographical in certain ways. Yeah. Music is deep. It's like you have, uh, you know, a lot of saxophone players, they love John Coltrane or whatever, but John Coltrane played his stuff for a reason. Is this not notes and blah blah, you know, whatever? He played Love Supreme and all that for a reason. It's just right. not, you know, uh writing some composition. Oh yeah, check this out. It's killing uh yeah, by the way that C C minor chord goes with the D7 flat sus and or no. You know, we need to know all of that, but you know. Yeah. Why did he write it? What, what, right. what inspired exactly. him to write that? Why is he playing the way? You can actually hear the pain in John Coltrane's playing. That's how deep it is. The way right. the world is. Mm-hmm. And that's why I want to bring it to your showcase on Saturday. So what was it like to present your music together? Because it's because a lot of times, as you say before, it's about me, me, me. But in your concept, at least looking at some of your shows, it's about us. It's the collective. It's about the universe. It's about the sound of the group, not just me leading this group. So talk about how you came to that, because that's not easy. And why you do it, because it's not popular and it's not the, that's not the, the broad path. Mm. Right. Um, you know, um, I really had to take my time when I moved to US. Um, and uh, when I was in Slovakia, um, I did my record. It was my third record called Essence. And that one was in 2014, and it was dedicated to um, my ancestors. It was all Slovak folk music rearranged to jazz by my long-term collaborator and pianist, great pianist Andrei Kranjak. And at that time, I had the opportunity to open up for uh, one of the greatest singers um, in the United States, Cassandra Wilson, uh, in Slovakia. And we became uh, friends. It's been a really interesting meetup with her. Um, you know, she's been on my radar as one of the greatest singers, um, very original with her sound, um, didn't go like the regular mainstream way, came to uh, New York, started to work with M Bass, you know, had, you know, a little different route. And um, um, I also joined her for her European tour at that time as an assistant tour manager because I have also managerial experience uh, on a side as a singer, I'm a manager. And um, I helped her out with the tour. So I saw, uh, it was wonderful experience. First of all, meeting uh, those great musicians, but also being in her presence and understanding what she went through as a singer all her life and uh, and, um, being helpful um, in that perspective, you know, and touring on that level. Um, Then we kind of, you know, I I was thinking of, she actually suggested that I should come to the United States, that I would have uh, so much, so many more opportunities. And um, she supported my stay over here um, in a way that, um, in in a visa, artist visa way, which I'm super grateful for that. And it's kind of like a dream come true. I can't even tell you, you know, Um, where we became friends and um, in a way that, um, that is really interesting, you know, so uh, we remain in contact, but at the same time, you know, when I got over here, I had to uh, lead my own path. And um, at that time, I started to, um, like I said, I joined the church because that was my first feeling like I had to really thank God. And I was looking for a strength in New York. New York can be really rough. And I went through a lot of stuff, you know, I've been beaten on the street and uh, all kinds of things. Yeah, in New York, the first year, it was crazy. So singing gospel and um, being baptized in a church um, 
was something real special for me. Um, and those experiences will always stay in my heart and they shaped me up because I was able to learn so much music over there. At the same time, I was um, uh, learning more about the, the culture and the history, black music. Uh, I was um, getting to know a lot of people on the scene and I naturally gravitated to the little older generation. I just felt like I have much more, um, I have much more uh, opportunities to kind of uh, uh, learn uh, more from the people that had been in contact with the masters. And that was one of her advice as well. She said, like, try to find a, um, somebody who could be your mentor. Try to find people that has been in contact with, uh, with the masters um, that can shape up your future, um, future artistic um, um, expression. And let me tell you something, even when I was in Slovakia, I was always the band leader. Um, I think I'm quite strong, but at the same time, I was very respectful when it comes to musicians. And I always um, took us as a band. And I was always curious what you or you or you can bring to the table. I was never really um, restrictive when it comes to what to play. And I was always saying, like, look, this is the form we, we said to each other, you know, how is it going to go? But at the same time, feel free to express yourself. And I love that about Tulu as well as the drummer, you know, that he is unconventional. He's very creative. Uh, he does a lot of interesting uh, hits and kicks. And um, he does them with me when I sing as well. You know, so he emphasizes um, those, um, those, um, those kicks. And that's why I surrounded myself naturally. You know, I talked to Tulu, he's here. So um, I was trying to find mainly a pianist that would work very well with me and who could be open to Slovak uh, folk music and who could be open to do, uh, working with the world music. And this is not an easy element, you know, because um, you gotta uh, take it, but you can't destroy it. You know, you gotta, you gotta know the, the good, um, good element or good, um, good specific uh, um, amount of um, maybe arrangement that is not gonna destroy that, that song. Um, and I was looking and looking and looking. It took me a long time. I talked to some of the pianists as well. Um, and then um, I think James Hurt was really a great person for that because uh, I know he worked on multiple um, projects that were world, world music projects, but he also understands um, European culture. And he knows that there's a lot of classical music involved. Um, well, we had Bartok, right, in, in yeah. Hungary who already worked with that type of music. And uh, he's married to American who has Czech roots. So <laughs> I thought it worked out right. It worked out really right. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, we, we, really, yeah. um, we really connected on, on the singers and musicians that we, we, we dug, you know, uh, like Phyllis Hyman, like Anita Baker, um, like, like Whitney Houston. Those are all my idols outside of jazz music, but at the same time, you know, idols that I really adore as a singers and where I feel my voice as a contra alto is, is kind of fits very well in, into that, um, into that um, setup, vocal setup. So mm. with the record, long, long story short, with the record Universal Ancestry, my idea was to connect the people from um, different cultural as well as racial backgrounds into one. Because I was thinking, if there wouldn't be color of the skin, if there wouldn't be religious beliefs, if there wouldn't be geographical boundaries, we as a people, as human race, uh, how would we come up together and how would we, you know, connect on the music? How would we jam, in other words, our ancestors? Yeah, and, that's a great point. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. been really interesting because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and this is, you know, our core is the DNA. So oh. that was the whole idea um behind my record so we're talking with Hanka G and Tara Alexander so you have to do this presentation <clears throat> the showcase for APAP and you, you come to them and say you know here's our idea here's our concept and knowing what's going on in the world today you did it in such a way although because of technology but you still made it seem intimate and like you're right there how did you how did you do that because that's not easy as you know the last two years of our lives but you made a show, make it feel like we were right there at home with you, creating Right. That. You know, it's been a lot, it's been challenging for both of us. 
and I think uh, for, for many musicians that we both connect very well with the live audience. Uh, we really love it. We miss it dearly. And we play a couple of concerts here and there, you know, when there was an opportunity and when the COVID cases were down. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, I'll, I'll take it from the positive side. You know, this, this pandemic brought us a uh, possibility to uh, have the best musicians on our record, you know, and do the projects that we wanted to do. Um, me doing my first uh, big United States project with uh, international musicians and for Taru as well, if, I'm, if I yeah. may speak for you, to gather your brothers and, and do the record that you always wanted to do. And um, as for the APEP show, you know, we, um, we professionals, so I, I really, you know, <laughs> I did live stream before and I could kind of uh, put myself in a feeling where I don't care that there's nobody sitting in there. I really tune in into the people because I know that there are people. And specifically, I sometimes imagine some of my friends sitting in there and that, that way it's, it's easier, you know? But at the same time, um, when you meet with great musicians and when you perform, that energy just creates regardless if there's anybody else, you know what I mean? And you just follow that vibe. And, and we just had so much fun, I have to tell you. Yes. Uh, we've been rehearsing the songs before and uh, as, as, as many musicians know that when you play uh, the songs for the first time, you're kind of a little afraid what's going to happen and if it's going to mm. get all together. <laughs> but when you get on that band and something magical happens and there's just like a switch. You got to do it. You got to do it. <laughs> I mean, nothing to it, but you do it. <laughs> just to there do is. it. Right. And we, of course, we had to pack the solos a little bit shorter because it was supposed to be 30 minutes. Uh, that's the purpose of this April showcase to show the agents, you know, what we can do in a short period of time. Um, but let me tell you, we had a great, great, great time. Yeah, and like I hope just people see. could feel it. You know, I really hope so. Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely, absolutely. That's why I wanted to reach out to you before, but I thought it's better actually talk to you afterwards because it's all gone. You can reflect on what happened and, mm -hmm. and look at look back at it yourselves. And yeah, that was it was cool to see. You. You guys put it together so nicely. Although you kind of answered the question, I'll, I'll ask it anyway. So what did you guys learn about yourselves over the past two years? I mean, because so much of your lives, have, like everybody else's life, have been altered and you have to pivot and, and change and do things you never thought you had to do. So what did, what did you guys learn about each other or yourselves as artists? You want to answer that? <laughs> you want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, you know, I mean, what can I tell you in New York? you know, you always know that you live in the small places, right? So it's always good to escape to a club or somewhere. <laughs> During pandemic, we had to be here together uh, in a small place. So we learned definitely a lot about each other, how to be, uh, like, I don't know, more more patient with each other yeah. as well. <laughs> and, uh, and suddenly you got all this time um, together as well. So um, that really taught us a lot about, as a musician, I think everything that was happening in the world reflected in our music. Um, I think one, uh, one of your songs, Pinocchio, if I'm not mistaken, has been inspired uh, by the politics uh, at that time when you recorded it. <laughs> um, my, we won't get into all of that. Yeah, my song. Speaks for itself. Speaks for itself. I did. <laughs> my song 2020 <laughs> my songs on my record um has been influenced you know by that for sure and um you know that's why i picked up a song also by donny hathaway sunday we will all be free which i dedicated to all my um like sisters and brothers and it was our take with a wonderful pianist shedrick mitchell by the way who was like a more like a, a, a fluid musical type of uh, pianist, uh, ranging from jazz gospel to R&B pop. Excellent, excellent musician, great yes, cat. Yes. And, uh, and many other songs that we picked up on the record, but uh, we've been listening to a lot of music. We saw a lot of documentaries. Yes. We talked a lot. You know, for me, the whole journey has been also maybe trying to enlighten the my friends and my musicians back in Slovakia. Uh, I don't think um, that um, they understand completely the, um, the history of this music and the origins of this music. 
I think um, it's more about the songs, about the ability how to solo, technicalities and education is very valued. I don't think that they realize that uh, a lot of it comes from life and the best school is to live that life over here and be surrounded with the masters. So um, it's still a process. So I don't know if they will ever get it. I'm trying to oh. really enlighten them. And, oh. uh, um, but, and also, you know, the racial injustice and all of that is just, uh, it's so much filtered when it comes to Slovakia. Um, for, for our people, you know, and they have, I don't think they realize how much uh, Black people went through, how much uh, struggle they went through, and the musician itself as well, musicians. Okay, you said that. Taro, there's a, there a film that came out about 10 years ago. Do you remember? It was called um, Black Power Mixtape. It came out about 10 years ago. It just, okay. to your point, Hanka, check it out. Um, okay. So, All right. So, Two, two filmmakers, this is between 1968 to 1973. Two filmmakers wow. from Europe came over because they wanted to understand civil rights, the, the race struggle. So they got a chance to interview Angela Davis while she was in prison. The only interview she gave was with oh, these guys. Man. Wow. Um, mm. so it was Angela Davis. Who else? Um, Stokey Carmichael. They got, she got, they got sent down with Stokey Carmichael, wow. 1967, 68. Oh, wow. Uh, also, H. Rap Brown. They got Black Panthers explaining their whole the whole mission so they gave unfettered access mm, so each year the college just, each year each year they come over to the states and go to oakland go to chicago and, the, okay. and they catch up here's what happened this year because they had no context it was like we see it exactly. but we don't understand it mm. to Hanka's point and so it's so it just so they had it and they filmed it and then, and then they lost it in the camp for decades found it re-edited it put it together it's on you can stream it's called black power mixtape because it talks about just the black power struggle between 68 to 73, 74. Wow. Even a young Louis Farrakhan talking about Harlem and what's happening and how the changes in gentrification, which is which is gonna mm. come. He's talking about that already. Wow. <laughs> wow. So it's called you know, Black Power Mixtape. So that's that, that's a must see. It's incredible. Thank Definitely you so much. We'll definitely out. check it out. Yeah. Thanks I mean specifically info. also, you know, um, Eastern Europe that was under communist regime. I mean, yeah. Nothing got really too much into our, the, our country. You know, there has been something, but it's been very filtered. And I think, um, yeah, I guess, I guess uh, there's a lot of naivety as well involved, you know, um, when it comes to a lot of stuff. And I don't think we can, anybody can ever understand it unless they live in this country. Right, and they were. That's the whole point of the film because they were coming over because they tried, they just couldn't understand it, and they actually, and the American wow. mainstream press wouldn't cover that stuff. Obviously, or as we know, what was going on mm -hmm. in, in the streets. So you get an idea of what really was like to be Angela Davis in prison dealing with this stuff, wow. or Sophie Carmichael deep. dealing with this stuff, or or, be, or or Newton, baby Newton, understanding. And it's funny they talked about even with the FBI. Said the biggest problem that they had with the Black Panthers, why they were, they were such a threat, was none of the things they expected because they were feeding kids. To, to them, that's why they were such a threat and they had to be dismantled because of the free market mm. program. Things like that. So that just gives an idea mm. as to how the world see, saw mm. them and how mm -hmm. they saw it themselves. So, anyways, that's a sidebar, but, but that's your homework assignment if you haven't had a chance to see that. See it. Yeah, well, well. Definitely. You. But Back to the, but the performance side of things. So for you to put this out here, now you got the two new albums out, Echoes of the Masters. And Hanka, your project again is called? Um, mine is called Universal Ancestry. And Universal it's coming Ancestry. up, yeah, uh, in a couple of months, actually, in the okay. United States. I'm doing like a separate uh, PR and release for that. Uh, okay. It came out in Slovakia, just for the time being, in Europe. Can, so to learn more about it, what's the website? What websites? What what websites can we go to? Mm -hmm. about your music content yeah. and yours, Tara. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. um, oh, wow! I so that um, people Goodbye. can definitely follow up through on uh, through alexander.com. Um, they can also uh, follow up Sunnyside Records. Right, right, That's right. That's the right. record label Sorry. that uh, the That's CD okay. came from. Um, so 
and, and so it's everywhere. It's on Spotify, right, it's on right. iTunes. Uh, uh, Bruce Apple, record is Orlando. everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. And my yeah. record will be on a similar um, similar streams as well pretty soon. I assume like in four months, probably so. By cool. June. Cool. Cool. And uh, Haka, if you go to our website, Tyro's album is our album of the week. So for, just to get an idea so people. Mm. Yeah, people can go and them. download and yes. purchase. Yes, yes. Uh, my record, like I said, you know, um, it's I'm I'm teasing it now. So <laughs> get ready, <laughs> get ready. Good. Hopefully Good. soon, in a couple of months, uh, three four months, and it, you can get more information, of course, uh, on hankag.com, h-a-n-k-a-g.com, and um, that's where I'm going to be posting a lot. Or you can follow me on a social media. I do have tons of information over there together with Taru as well. Right. Taru uh, has a very simple one, uh, both on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. He, his account is Taru Alexander um, and mine is Hanka Sinks. So it's H-A-N-K-A Sinks. Nice, nice. Hey. Thank you. It's kind of weird not being together because we're, I'd always run into you guys at Winter Jazz Fest or APAP or Jazz Congress, but it's still good to see you guys Still yeah. smiling, still smiling. Likewise. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank so, you uh, so much, Derek. Uh, thank man, you very much. Wow. Uh, thank you. And uh, like I said, hopefully see you sooner than later in person. Yes. Yes. Likewise. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes, thank indeed. you very much to everybody who listened. Oh, oh thank you for uh, doing this for us. And uh, take care of yourselves. Okay, Dallas, yeah. you All right, hang on one second here. Mm -hmm.